My name is Valerie Dastu, and I am a PhD candidate in gerontology at King's College London. Um, my research is interested in the supportive and service needs of adults with autism post-parental care. Hi. I am truly grateful for the opportunity provided to me by the British Society of Gerontology and King's College London to interview my mentor idol, Professor Sir Michael Rudder who is indeed um, a legend in autism research and practice. Learning from the lived experiences of adults with autism and their family members and leaders in the field like yourself will help advance our understanding, support and services for people aging with autism. As someone who has experienced and been influential in many of these changes, would you briefly comment for me on what you see as the major advancements in scientific understanding, intervention modalities, and the social awareness of autism? Well, there are many, of course, but let me just pick a few out. Um, the first thing to say is that my interest in autism came as part of a follow-up study which extended into adult life. So it was a lifespan approach for me right from the very beginning. And what became clear, and which has been confirmed many times subsequently, is that uh, individuals with autism are very varied. They have things in common, of course, but they're very varied, and that any kind of service needs to take that into account. A few do really well and are coping in the adult world uh, without much in the way of help, but they are very few. And at the other extreme, there are those who are needing total care. So what are the big changes? Let's focus particularly in the last few years. I think one of the changes is that autism used to be seen as something which was individual and different from all other mental disorders. But it's now clear that it's not like that, really. The overlap between autism and ADHD, attention deficit, disorder with hyperactivity, it's very considerable. But there are also other overlaps, and one needs to be concerned with that as a whole. Um, so the classification, the diagnosis, has been much changing over time. But in addition, the awareness of services has changed. So. Um, when I first started, everybody was thought to have an infantile psychosis. They were treated with um, some form of psychotherapy. Uh, but it's now utterly shifted so that the focus is on the cognitive problems that underlie autism and on behavioral treatments. But in following the individuals through, people have become aware that what are the services for adults going to do? And one of the things that many of the families that I have seen over the years are concerned about is that children's services no longer will accept them because their trusts tell them they've got to stop at age 18 or 16 or whatever that particular trust sets. Adult services, by contrast, are expected to deal with it but aren't used to dealing with the problems that have, have a background in childhood. So, for example, my colleague, Professor Patricia Howlin, has been concerned in looking at what can be done in um, support for employment. And it's clear that is an important intervention. It doesn't solve all problems, but uh, it's clear that with appropriate help, and almost all individuals with autism need help moving into employment, uh, they can move on. In 1943, when Dr. Kanner first identified autism as a distinctive disorder, little thought was given to aging with autism, although we do know that it is a lifelong disorder. And even indeed in 1995, in his foreword to Temple Grandin's book, Thinking in Picture, Oliver Sacks stated, we almost always speak of autistic children, never of autistic adults, as if such children never grew up. 
the problem with this is now we have adults with autism who are were first diagnosed who are now older and middle-aged adults as well as adults who are newly diagnosed with autism so this is indeed a new aging population that we have not experienced before um, as you said some adults with autism can manage with minimal supports while others need lifelong support um, what do you see and, and, and yet, most of these adults with autism will outlive their parents. Many yeah. are still living with their parents yeah. and will outlive them. What do you see as being the priorities for families, for adults with autism, and for services in order to maintain their well-being into the future? Well, that's a very important question. And the families, as you say, the parents, as the, their autistic child, moves into adult life and indeed into middle age and older are concerned what will happen when we're no longer here and have been they've had difficulties in sorting out what kind of support may be available and that's not been easy i no. have to say um, because there, there isn't as it were a recognized way of dealing with all of this um, but I think what most of them have wanted is to have somebody to whom they can turn when problems crop up. So in the services provided at the Maudsley Hospital, um, we see a number of people who I've been concerned with sometimes up to half a century yes. and who are now worried about getting really old. Um, and what uh, the services try to provide is not ongoing treatment but an ability to be called on as and when a crisis comes up. That's a very economical way of doing things because it doesn't cost a lot to do that and it doesn't waste anybody's time but recognizes that you have to be able to do that. Right. So. One of the main things is the support services all around the individuals. Um, now, we also don't know very much about whether the aging process in individuals with autism differs in any way. So that's an important research need. Right. Maybe it'll turn out it doesn't differ. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, it might. And if it does turn out to be different, we would need to recognize that in what we provide. Right. As you said, parents are a, a key support for adults yeah. with autism, as well as the um, proactive services yeah. are necessary. Do you think that service providers should um, address um, future support needs, and who should do it and when? Oh. Uh, somebody should do it. Yes. Uh, I mean I think that people argue as to what discipline or what branch of mental services um, is most appropriate. That doesn't seem to me the right question. Uh, who, it needs one person who can pull things together and call on people who are more expert in this aspect or that aspect as and when needed. And yes, one needs to talk this through and um, the need is to be upfront about it. Yes. Um, I mean, currently, there's a lot of concern in the parents about losing benefits. So the whole benefit system is changing, and uh, that's quite problematic. There are also um, disputes as to who provides the service, so that I've seen quite a lot of parents uh, faced with a problem. Everybody agrees something is needed, right. but they all say, no, it's not my concern. This is, this is not a mental disorder. Uh, this is a developmental disorder, or it's uh, intellectual impairment. Uh, and so there's this ridiculous argy-bargy as to whose budget. It's all the same budget, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the public purse. And so arguing as to which little bit of the public purse it is, I think is really, well, it's offensive, quite honestly. It shouldn't be happening like that, but it does. Yes. 
and yet the consequences of not having plans in place or some yeah. kind of a service can be detriment, very detrimental. Yeah, they can. Because many of these adults with autism have difficulty with change, first of yes. all, and, have, and comorbidities of mental health are yes. very high. How can we monitor that they need the support? Well, by having somebody who's on call, uh, mm. I, I'm not much in favour of, of repeated measurement, as it mm -hmm. were. That's not usually working as well as some ongoing uh, concern. And um, so that, if you like, it's the sort of equivalent to what the government has introduced this April that people over the age of 75 have got an allocated GP to whom they can turn. And because one of the problems that people have complained about is almost all GP services are in group practices and you see a different person every time. Right. That is not good no. when dealing with chronic conditions. They may deal with acute conditions all right. Um, so similarly, I think, with individuals with autism who are aging, there needs to be somebody uh, who has that kind of integrating role, checking what's needed as and when the need arises, not intervening when it's not required. Right. So uh, this is not an expensive service to run. Right. And do you think the awareness in the community is heightened to the extent that people in the community will be more aware? of difficulties that someone's experiencing? Yes. Um, I hesitate slightly because I think the awareness um, is not as good as I would like. Um, it's not been helped by the high-profile cases where somebody has gone on a killing spree yes. and has been said to have Asperger's Absolutely. syndrome or autism. Whether they have or haven't, I have no idea. Right. What is clear from the surveys that have been done is that it's rare. Yes. Most individuals with autism don't behave like that. And so one's got to recognize the reality of the occasional rare instances when somebody goes berserk, but recognize that most autistic individuals, the worst they can do or do do is l get frustrated yes. and don't know how to deal with it and and smash their watch or whatever not they don't go around shooting people no and but they do struggle with depression yeah and are at risk of suicide yes yes a big part of my goal is to transcend the academic world more than just through peer-reviewed re journals and academic um, meetings to actually make an impact for adults with autism and their families as they age in providing a supportive service in post-parental care. Who would you suggest or how should I be networking at this moment to make sure, to ensure that that impact is is realized at the end of this research? Well, I think the charities concerned with autism, such as Autistica, uh, are probably the best group to be concerned with it. They're very experienced in the publicity and are aware that publicity requires skill right. uh, and that um, most of us have bad experiences with the media as well as very good experiences. Um, so I would see uh, them. They have meetings from time to time which involve individuals with autism and their carers and it's those sort of occasions. Uh, as and when events, public events come up, well, fine, communicate there. And I think that the sort of research you're doing should involve a mixture of qualitative evidence and quantitative evidence. Yes. You need to know the numbers you've got different sorts of problems, but you also need to know their take on those problems, what they make of them, what they think of them, and what they think about the services they're getting. And it's not that there is an answer, that this is the right way of looking at it, uh, but it, it means that they must be heard yes. uh, with other people, and that what they have to say about this is important. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, thank you very, very much, Professor Rutter, for sharing with me your insights into my research and to adults with autism for the future for their service and support needs. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you very much.